It's a project in the lab uh, that's been out swabbing subways since 2015. Uh, started just in New York City, but has expanded to a global consortium in over 100 cities that on, on an annual and sometimes more frequent basis go out and swab public transit, city centers, hospitals in some cases, to build the genetic profile of the cities. It, it started first as a project out of pure curiosity because my daughter licked a subway pole and I just really wanted to know what was there. But it's since expanded uh, into a much more uh, useful uh, project in the sense that we can track antibiotic resistance as it emerges. We can discover new species. We can actually track uh, things like COVID and where the virus is moving. And along the way, there's a forensic capacity because every area of the world has a slightly different biodiversity profile at the macroscopic level, like kangaroos in Australia, but they're not in Canada. The same thing is true at a microbial level. So different areas of the world and cities have a unique signature that you can use to build algorithms to say, aha, I can see you have these specific microbes and viruses that are indicative of where you've come from. So we've used this project, it's called Metasub, or the metagenomics of subways and urban biomes to track sort of the, the dynamics of the urban environments in which we live. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 140. And this episode is with Christopher E. Mason and Igor Tolchinsky. Chris is an accomplished man of many titles, but most immediately, he is professor of neuroscience in the Brain and Mind Institute at Weill Cornell Medicine. And Igor Tolchinsky, on the other hand, also very accomplished, is the, the founder, chairman, and CEO of WorldQuant, which is a global quantitative asset management firm. And this is a particularly interesting and novel episode for me because it represents a marriage of finance and academia. So together, Chris and Igor lead a joint project between Cornell Medicine and WorldQuant. It's called the WorldQuant Initiative for Quantitative Prediction. And it combines WorldQuant's expertise in financial prediction and analysis. <laughs> analysis. I don't know uh, why that came out so weird. With Chris and his team's genetic and medical research to improve and deploy new methods of preventive medicine. So we talk about this partnership and also Chris and Igor's new book that just came out, The Age of Prediction. And The Age of Prediction details how our rapidly improving technology, data collection, and predictive algorithms are changing the world in innumerable ways. And some of these ways that we discuss are the rise of smart weapons, uh, autonomous drones, for instance, the role of genetics in solving crimes, the role of genetics in, in shifting insurance premiums, how prediction is affecting job performance assessment and hiring and plenty of other stuff. So I like to mention that reviews, comments, likes, subscribes, they are endlessly appreciated. And now, without any further ado, I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Chris and Igor. As far as I know, your partnership began in 2017 with the establishment of the World Quant Initiative for Quantitative Prediction at Weill Cornell Medicine. And when I saw this, the first question that came to my mind and which I'm still wondering about is why, Igor, is it compelling for you to invest so much time and money in a project on predictive medicine when you've already had and are continuing to have great success as an investor and entrepreneur? So what is your interest in this area of research in particular? Oh, it was very compelling. I, I, I got an invitation to visit Chris and his lab uh, back in those days. And uh, when I saw the lab, uh, I was struck by how similar it was to what we do. There were also rows and rows of computers crunching uh, data, looking for uh, patterns, uh, uh, matching genes. So uh, my interest uh, was piqued. Uh, uh, right away, and uh, Chris and I uh, became uh, uh, friends, and then, then uh, it seemed like a natural, uh, natural uh, extension just to uh, to create the center to enable all these uh, uh, great things to happen. Hmm. 
And one of the things that surprised me is that it's a marriage of finance and medicine. So how do tools in economic or financial prediction work in a medical context. So Chris, I was really surprised to see that financial analysts in Igor's company are actually your collaborators on this project. Yeah, yeah, very much and and you know colleagues so they come in in the lab it's basically a a, a perk if you will if you if they're doing really well at WorldQuant we it's an exchange program so we have people who've come from WorldQuant and financial analysts who then come to Cornell and work in the lab uh, either between my lab or uh, Olivier Lamento or other collaborating labs and work on projects that have large amounts of data and, and looking for signal, including everything from cancer research to microbiology to even forensics. We help solve a crime in one case where there was blood left at the scene of a crime and use one of the algorithms designed by one of the, the quants who came to Cornell to work on it. So it you know, basically is an exchange program on that direction, but also Cornell graduate students and, and researchers have gone to WorldQuant to try and try their hand at machine learning methods uh, from biology to finance. And there it's, it's unusual, but it's, as Igor and I have chatted over many years, it's amazing how a lot of times the, the, the key steps of finding lots of data, cleaning the data, designing algorithms, and using some tools are public, some are private, but you have to design new tools. The steps are very similar between both of our, our worlds. And it's been very fun for the, for the programmers and the researchers to go back and forth because uh, I think they get they get a lot of experience. Some of them have gone on to start companies. Other ones have gone on to keep doing research. Uh, some of them are still working at both of our institutions. So it's been a lot of fun to have this, the first ever medical school uh, quant uh, exchange program, basically. Yeah, it's uh, similar. It's similar enough, and 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 yet different enough. Mm -hmm. Those. Uh, so there. Well, here's just a quote from your book. So maybe you can give me. Uh, a specific example or our listeners a specific example, but you wrote that a surprising common thread of prediction is that the methods used in one discipline can inform another. Metrics like the Gini coefficient can measure economic differences, yet we can also use the same formula to map shifts in bacterial DNA to predict growth and resistance to antibiotics. antibiotics. So are there any maybe specific examples of the marriage between financial analysis and medical advances that might make this partnership salient for our listeners? The, the, I think the one you just mentioned is, is one that was the first one we found, is that it literally is the exact same algorithm, the same formula being used in finance and in microbiology. So that was one of, one of the first sort of instincts. The other one was a lot of work on uh, a classifier, so machine learning classifiers that look for across thousands and thousands of samples for, for epigenetic status. This is you think of the DNA is at the genetic level, the epigenetic is on top in this regulation behind DNA. We actually use that to find what are the parts, the signals that are the most differentiated as a function of age to figure out the, the age of blood left at the scene of a crime was something that was the, the same code for looking at cleaning data and looking at signals. Uh, most of this is with neural networks uh, or with random forest algorithms are the two methods deployed. You can use them in either capacity and, and they uh, essentially you know, helped us find the, the age of blood left at the scene of a crime. So it's these some of the same even tools and then also some of the same uh, Python code toolkits that are available can help you generate preliminary algorithms. So it was, it was an easy uh, way to take these methods and apply them. Cool. And maybe one last thing before we jump into the age of prediction, just so people can get an idea of the real world practical power of medical prediction. I found this story very neat in your book. So Chris, what I have in mind is your uncle Ben's cancer, which I think the story behind that I think is really a testament to the power of this sort of work. Yeah, in this case, it was a very personal note in the book, of course, because I was writing about my uncle who had been diagnosed with cancer that first we thought was just in his lungs, but then had metastasized into his brain into multiple lymph nodes. So really a late stage cancer that the oncologist gave us maybe one or two months to live, the first ones we talked to, and recommended whole brain radiation, aggressive chemotherapy. And what was interesting is, you know, I work at a cancer center, we're at the hospital, and we have discussion all the time about predictive algorithms to take even a small bit of fragments of DNA and predict, you know, everything you can about it. It's actually, uh, Igor and I both like to predict everything we possibly can from every bit of data we can get. And in the case of my uncle, uh, the uh, the first oncologist we talked to thought we should do really aggressive therapy, but hadn't tried to look for these 
fragments of DNA in the blood called cell-free DNA, that even if you have small bits of traces of DNA, it's enough to find the specific mutation from the cancer. Because as you cancers grow, they start shedding DNA. You can pick it up in the blood and find very specific mutations. And we found one for uh, a therapy that was that was custom matched for his mutation in EG, what's called a gene called EGFR. And we're able to actually uh, get him instead of a few months to live, he had, uh, got three years uh, more to his life. Uh, eventually, uh, sadly, he died of COVID actually, not from cancer. So uh, it, it was really a unique opportunity though, to use the latest algorithms to find the best clue to give him the best therapy. Hmm. Very neat. And now without any further ado, the book that you two wrote and published last week, I think, unless unless something changed. Cool. So first, congratulations. And second, I'll, I'll, I'll ask Igor, what do you two mean when you say that we are in the age of prediction? We mean that uh, with uh, data growing exponentially and uh, tools, uh, AI-based uh, tools also making uh, step functions, uh, prediction is becoming uh, better and better. So, uh, and uh, basically, uh, all AI is a kind of a prediction, and you can uh, even uh, take it further, and you can say that all, all, all life is a kind of uh, prediction. So, so uh, with the proliferation of uh, predictive uh, technologies and predictive uh, abilities, uh, really the world is uh, changing because when you can predict something, you know, one, one, one potential difference between uh, medicine and, uh, and financial markets is that in the financial markets, you're, when you predict something, you typically trade on it and, and you change what you predict. In uh, medicine, maybe sometimes it's also the same, but usually the two variables are independent. Hmm. Well, something that I think is really important to highlight here is that when you to say quite rightly that prediction is becoming better and better, I see at least, and, and you two should amplify this or correct me. There are there are two prongs to this. One, we are we have more and more access to data, and two, we have more and more powerful ways of interpreting the data. And it's these two things together that lead to the increase in our ability to predict. It, do you think that that's roughly correct? Okay, great. And in the book, you introduce, I think, a technical reading of the word risk as it relates to prediction. So how do you two think of risk and prediction and how they go in hand, go hand in hand? After all, I'll jump in. They are very intricately linked. And so if you can get perfect prediction, in theory, your risk can get very, very low, even close to zero. Or we describe in the book cases where, could you imagine if, if, if you could perfectly predict everything about the market, you wouldn't necessarily even need uh, to to have any people do predictions on market if the market was so predictable, it would be it would actually eliminate a lot of the you know ability to make money on the market or to predict trends, and you would just be stuck with uh, essentially giving out loans at a higher interest, uh, the, and then you know recouping savings at a different interest. It would be like the only way you could make money. But there's a lot of signal in the noise. But as the predictions get better, the information becomes the the real differentiator. So who can get access to information? And then the other one is the models that you build on top of it. So you really need both those engines to get differentiation. But uh, the main point of the book, though, is by the age, is it means it's, it's everywhere. So they, this same quest to predict lets us also find, you know, even though in medicine you usually make a prediction for a diagnostic, you can also act on it like much, the, much the same way you would in a market. So if you see a signal that you can only pick up with a little algorithm for example, a very rare mutation or a very specific change to a cell, you can then use that to say, I think I know the weakness of a cancer, or I know the antibiotic that it can use that's specific to this infection. So the predictive algorithms in medicine really give you a light with which you can see the best therapy, the best path forward. And, and just like in finance, so you can be wrong. Uh, so you can be wrong because uh, it's not as simple as you think, or there's an additional mutation, or there's additional bacteria, 
uh, and same way in the markets, they could think you know the answer, but of course they can change. But uh, and also with cancer, cancer evolves, right? So you make a prediction, maybe you squash the cancer for six months, but then it comes back again. So you have to continuously update your your algorithms, and the same thing happens in in finance. This it's it's really a constant gardening of data to make sure you have the best and brightest light towards the future. But uh, but it, it is a, a continual struggle because uh, by, you know biology changes, the markets change, the predictions have to be uh, adaptive, and that's how we build them at both of our uh, homes. In uh, finance, uh, risk is a uh is what you cannot predict. So we we predict what we can and the things that we cannot predict, we try to neutralize to them so, so they don't affect the outcome. Hmm. Well, Igor Finance really hasn't come up on the podcast yet. So economics, yes. Uh, yesterday, I, I was telling Chris before we spoke, I talked to the, the former president of Harvard and okay. Obama's, or I think Clinton's secretary of the treasury, Larry Summers, but, but not finance. So I really wanted to take the opportunity to ask about prediction in your line of work. So you run a, a very successful quantitative hedge fund in which one way of increasing wealth is predicting the future prices of stocks or commodities. But these prices are far from determined just by financial statements. And as you two already write, I think, in the introduction of your book, predicting economic trends, what leaders will do, what gaffes CEOs will have, all of this is extraordinarily complicated. Man. So how does the quantitative prediction process at WorldQuant look roughly without having to give us all your proprietary information? Uh, roughly, it looks like this, that we have different predictive algorithms, which typically operate uh, of different uh, data sets, and they make uh, predictions in, in different ways. And uh, no prediction method is perfect, but by merging uh, all these different uh, methods, you kind of build like a pyramid of stronger and stronger uh, predictions. So. Uh, in, in a nutshell, uh, uh, that's how it works, and it's based on the concept that uh, kind of all uh, all ideas, all theories are uh, flawed. There's the risk in the idea itself, in the formula itself. Hmm. So I just gave you away our secret. <laughs> so you say that, right, and I understand that the risk in any individual formula cancels out, but is the... The risk then, the major risk that you're up against, the sorts of black swans that someone like Nassim Nicholas Taleb writes about, that's what really might throw a wrench in either a medical prediction, like COVID with with uh, your uncle, or uh, a financial crash that was very difficult to predict. Is that the sort of risk that you're up against? I think the definition of a black swan is something that you cannot predict. So uh, yes, you, you invariably uh, come up against uh, uh, such events, but you try to uh, deal with that by being very, very diversified so that when such events do happen, they don't affect you uh, very much. Uh, there are kind of, there are the ripples in the market, which you can predict. And there are these waves, the black swans, which, uh, uh, and much harder to predict. So we try to be neutral to the latter and predict the former. I see. And so the diversification measures that might be used to combat potential black swans are the natural ones of not putting all your eggs in one basket. And if you invest in one thing that might be sensitive to a particular species of black swan, you would counteract that. And this is obviously quite... Uh, general by investing in something that is not sensitive to this sort of black swan, or in investing in the opposite direction, something that's sensitive to the opposite direction, like a a put and a call or something. If you're okay, perfect. And I think now would be kind of fun to switch gears to some of the more speculative uh, dimension. I mean, this might be redundant. The speculative dimensions of prediction that you two cover in your book or how it's changing 
uh, in the age of prediction, how it might be used in the future. And one of these that you discuss in the book that I thought was particularly fascinating uh, ties to the military. So what is the the role or what are the roles of prediction in autonomous police or military drones? We can go. Oh, first of all, it was, yeah, I guess uh, a, a lot. I, we've talked about it at length in the book. Yeah, as, as you can kind of tell, the chapters are broken down of what are the interesting facets of life that are fundamentally transformed by, by AI and prediction. But of course, it's really all, all of life. So we just focused on some of the more salient and I think intriguing applications. And, you know, the uh, autonomous machines, autonomous killing, you know, really is, is something that a lot of people are really terrified about, but the military is in heavily investing in. Some of it's for obvious reasons, for safety, because if you can have a, a drone uh, do the you know surveillance and get out uh, in front of a place where there's a harm that wouldn't be a soldier, that's good. It saves lives and is simpler. There's security risk, though. If a drone gets captured, you want to make sure it, it doesn't release any secrets. But the, the autonomous dr drones are some of the war machines that have been de deployed, even are being tested, uh, are um, it's a heavy area investment by the military. There's an entire division of AI. Uh, DARPA is working a lot on this. There, there is uh, everything from uh, you know automated cluster bombs that try and look for essentially signals that could be heat signatures or trying separating out by visual algorithms what's present on the ground. Those are, those are early stages. Uh, or actually, when Igor and I were having dinner uh, a few weeks ago, we just had this thought experiment of what if you just design a, a program drone that just says kill, you know, kill and avoid being killed, just kill anything that looks like it's a drone that's anything else and release, you know, thousands of them. And we talked about, would we have to release, you know, almost like benevolent drones that go out and like stop those drones and look for any signs of heart arrhythmia based on, you know, the pulse, because you can look at infrared camera on your face and see if you're having heart palpitations that might indicate an early stage heart attack or like we have this fun thought experiment of benevolent and evil drones all out swarming around battling each other. And so it, it, well, I guess what's which really not at all in question is that the AI tools are embedded in almost every arm of the military at this point including, again, benevolent parts like parts of Space Force look for asteroids that might be coming towards Earth, and there's machine learning tools to try and scan the sky for safety. But at the same time, those uh, satellites are looking down to try and look for a military advantage. And so we, uh, it, it was an interesting chapter to think about the, the ethics of, could you have a, a machine that would be ethical enough to know when it could kill? And uh, the, the moral machine experiment is one thing we talked about in there. And the answer is, maybe it basically it could be somewhat ethical, but it's going to probably get some things wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was very, uh, very interested by this conversation about attempts to ward against uh, takeover or something by AI, by programming morality into them, which is a really fascinating prospect. Do you know if anybody has had success with this uh, or anything to this effect? The, the closest, like Jan LeCun has been doing some of this from his work at, he's the head of AI at Facebook. Uh, he's at least been describing some of the work on this, they, but people haven't gotten that far yet. I guess the thing we, uh, I think that we like putting in the book is that it would be based on the psych sociology and psychology experiments. It would, it would be possible to try and get morality or to get the intelligence to be aware of other intelligences, almost trying to teach it to become, uh, you know, empathic as an AI or, or to really have, you know, uh, at least sympathy which is it hasn't been done yet, but we but I think artificial intelligence is like all intelligence. It'll go through stages and could potentially have it. And the moral machine experiment we described in the book is across the world. There was a study to, to survey how would people if you had a car that was about to hit an old person or a young person, what would you have the machine do? And and if it was a or you know if it was someone that was in a wheelchair versus someone running, try to look at abilities versus age versus sex. And around the world, it was very it was highly variable. So most people would save the young person instead of the old person if you had to like strike something if you're a autonomous car for example but whether or not you'd save the male versus female all else being equal depended a little bit on where you were in the world because the view of sexes is different uh the view of uh, abilities is different also what people are doing in terms of their health appearance was different so it was fascinating to see that there's probably not one simple moral algorithm but you may have to have somewhat of a context dependent view depending on where you are in the world um, or at least that's how the world is today. Whether you could design an algorithm that would be universal moral machine, as we wrote about in the book, is complicated today, but I think still not impossible. The interesting thing about AI is it's kind of, you know, naturally it's kind of neutral. It may make 
errors one way or the other way. Once you program in morality, if you get a if you put in a plus sign instead of a minus sign, you could get a very immoral machine as well. So bugs become much more of a of an issue there. Hmm. Well, drilling back down into this military dimension, what is a te- maybe you don't have a technical definition, but what is a a smart weapon and I guess more particularly, what is the the role of precision in modern war? And then how does it connect specifically to prediction? It, it's in, it's imperfect today. Like the, 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 we know that the, what we wrote a bit at length in that chapter was that we, it, the, it, there's an alarming rate of false positives. In this case, people who are, uh, you know, not non-combatant deaths that happen from the existing AI platforms. But, I, I still think that's been everything that has been deployed to date, and it, it's still you still could imagine a, a future though where the bombs would, uh, if they if they miss their target, their last program would be to disable itself or to self destruct. So you wouldn't have unexploded ordnance uh, as it would, that leads to a loss of precision, or the ways to actually use you know some of the image recognition software to make sure you're targeting who you think you are could be beneficial. Of course, that could make it more deadly because you can say I only want to target uh, this specific group of 10 people and search until you find them, uh, which has not happened yet. But we, we actually had yeah, dinner brainstorming about if you design an algorithm, say, to, to kill Chris Mason or Igor Tolchinsky and only my face and just release a thousand drones, it would be very hard to, to stop. That could be the most precise killing machine. And it would be very hard to stop, uh, which is terrifying. And so that's why we think we need benevolent machines that might float around you. And maybe they go get you coffee and they keep you safe. Maybe we talked about both in the book, yeah. And keep your face in the shade. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. You've mentioned a couple of times now these recent dinners in which you've been brainstorming about possibilities for AI and prediction. And what sparks my curiosity about this is that you've already written the book and the book is published. So I'm curious, Igor, is the reason that you two are having and continuing to have these conversations because you're continually looking for new possibilities to invest in in the future or ideas to keep your eye out for? Or is this just fun speculation? At this point, it's a fun speculation that naturally kind of arises once you think something through. Uh, you know, you, you you naturally get 10 other thoughts that come out of uh, that thought and from those 10 thoughts you get uh, 20 more and so it goes uh, on and on and that's that's why we have these uh, uh, dinners and uh, endless conversation maybe uh, we have to write volume to <laughs> yeah for <laughs> sure well, the sequel yeah coming well Igor I'm guessing that this is more in y'all in your ballpark I, I I probably should have asked how the division of labor worked I mean the project was clearly very collaborative but I would just assume that some of the more financial related finance related chapters were uh, more squarely in Igor's domain and then some of the more medical related chapters were in Chris's but the connection between insurance and prediction should be somewhat obvious to anyone who thinks about it. If you're writing a health insurance policy for someone who's a smoker versus someone who's a non-smoker, then all things being equal, you'll charge the smoker more because they're more likely to need treatment. But Igor, how is the the rise in predictive powers altering the insurance industry? Well, it's it's making it uh, more more and more specific and more and more targeted, uh, and more and more information is available. Uh, for example, data from uh, smartwatches, uh, uh, results of uh, DNA sequencing, uh, and uh, various other. There's just so much data that you can uh, really uh, predict uh, people's uh, susceptibility to specific. Uh, diseases and uh, the, the state of their health and, uh, and, and the mood and you can always you can almost uh, you know have like a real-time uh, risk estimation for uh, f- for insurance so like, like all the other things it's uh, becoming uh, 
uh, simpler but uh, but uh, more complicated as a result because the more you predict something, the the more you leverage it, your, your prediction, the more you leverage your prediction, the more you wind up with the risks that you haven't even thought of before. Hmm. One thing that struck out stuck out at me in my own life is I have a a family friend who is very, who's overweight and diabetic and his health insurance company sent him like a Wi-Fi scale and a keto diet plan. And he's supposed to like weigh in every few days. The information gets sent to them. If he follows the keto diet plan and his weight goes down, then his insurance rates goes down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and also even cars do this too. Like the, when you oh, I mentioned the book, but if you get a new car insurance policy, they'll want you to put in a little tracker into your you know glove compartment and say, okay, we want to know how fast you're driving, where you're driving. Which uh, you know, even though I'm a big fan of prediction, uh, my wife was like, we're not putting that in my in our car, so we didn't we didn't put it in. So we uh, opted to pay a slightly higher rate because she uh, she didn't want. I I didn't seem to carry the way, but there's something there's a little bit of a creepiness factor of everybody watching you all the time. And, uh, you know, there's other ways, though, that you could have, you know, drones in the sky that could take pictures of you everywhere you go. So I, I think I think pretending and hoping that the world isn't watching you is going to get harder and harder to do. And so uh, and, and to some degree, the insurance companies are behaving very rationally. They want to have a better policy and also incentivize people to be healthier. So I think uh, that that's the the rosy version, but they could also be nefarious and overcharge you or lead to you know, increased stress in people's lives or lead to, you know, essentially psychological problems if, if there's other reasons they're not losing weight, right? It might not just be as simple as a keto diet. And so there, there's ways where it could be good or bad on how this gets deployed for sure. Right. Something that the two of you do very well in the book is keep in mind the interplay between privacy and prediction, because as we talked about at the beginning of our conversation, it's not just that the t- technology for prediction is getting better. It's that there is more and more data and that data has to come from somewhere. But we just talked about it a little bit in the case of the driving, but how else does this relationship play out in the case of insurance? The, the other way I guess I'll start with health insurance is just you know, the genetic information uh, can be used. It can't be used to deny you health insurance. It used to be able to until 2008. You could actually use a genetic test to tell someone you're not going to get insurance. But there's something called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA, that prevents it for hiring and firing or for health insurance. But if you want to look at long-term care insurance, say you, you know you have a genetic risk for Alzheimer's and you want to go get a policy that says, okay, I'm, I'm healthy now, I'm 45, but I'm worried what if I'm 65, 70, that I have Alzheimer's because I'm at a high risk and my family has it. I want to get a policy that protects me. They could ask you to take a test and then use that to say, okay, we're going to charge you a higher rate. Uh, there was a bill just passed in Florida to prevent that, but there, there is, you know, idea of long-term care insurance or even uh, disability insurance where you can use these tools to make a better prediction and change the insurance on people. So that's something that is, that is ongoing right now in different States and different insurance policies. Another, I mean, I don't think it's unrelated uh, potential downfall or or harm for society of this increase in data and predictive power is the tolls it might take on employment and job performance, which is another thing that you two discuss at length in the book. But how is prediction becoming increasingly important in the hiring process? I imagine, Igor, this might play a role in your business since you have many different offices for world font. Yes. Well, we, we, we screen our employees quite, uh, extensively, but in all honesty, uh, it's not so easy to predict, uh, who's going to do well and who's uh, not going to do well beyond a certain point. There are of course, uh, red flags. If somebody can't program, they're not, not going to do well with us, but, uh, but one, once you get to a certain level, uh, it becomes uh, very subtle. And uh, this is because uh, human uh, intelligence and human intellect is, uh, is, is a very uh, complex thing. And it's very hard to, to predict uh, how creative somebody is going to uh, 
be because it's just so uh, so unique and so uh, so path dependent. Uh, on the other hand, AI can uh, is is very good at uh, you know uh, eliminating uh, redundant uh, aspects of uh, many jobs, uh, like uh, writing basic code and uh, basic emails and. Uh, and things like that. So uh, it's uh, definitely a, a disruptor. Mm -hmm. You say though, you say it's not easy to predict, but we're just we're just entering the age of prediction. So it will get better and better at doing it. Though of course there will always remain the the black swans. But is the prediction, the role of prediction in job performance already having an impact on the job market and people's hiring, or is this more speculative about the future? Uh, I think it's already there uh, uh, to, to a certain uh, extent. Uh, but it's a very... It, it's a very difficult task. It may be uh, easy in, in, uh, in some industries and uh, in some areas, but I, I, I think uh, as uh, jobs kind of get pushed uh, higher and higher uh, up the abstraction uh, level to predict performance uh, will be uh, difficult. U ultimately, there's always a balance struck between uh, men and machines uh, that's kind of symbiotic. Uh, where men leverage the machines uh, as much as uh, they can, but but but, and, and, but the problem becomes just more and more abstract and more and more uh, high level. Hmm. The main way in which I'm familiar with data and prediction in today's job environment just comes from the news and Amazon because Amazon gets a lot of flack for the the metrics it takes on its employees whether they're driving delivery trucks or whether they're working in factories and how they'll be penalized based on their performance and i suppose that though it's not really couched typically in terms of prediction they might be fired if their metrics aren't up to par because that's the indicative of what their future performance will be like and I suppose, Chris, uh, prediction, ha I mean, prediction has long played a role in employment and in academia. You aren't going to get employed in academia unless you've already got a good track record of publishing papers. You don't want to take grad students into your lab if they haven't performed well. So it's really just perhaps a more precise way of doing what's always been done. Yeah, or, or at least making it faster and doing some filtering that you might do anyway, but helping like a keyword search in a CV is easy to filter for things that you know you want, skills or experience. But I, I think, you know, one actually, oh, the fun part of the book, though, is talking about papers that have looked at the GRE scores for people that go into grad school and how well they do at the end. And it, it's actually almost completely not predictive is how well someone did on their GRE. Uh, and so th there are, and it depends on the discipline, but there we, we, what's interesting is I think we've all had this this idea that it must be a certain kinds of tests or certain instincts that would be the most predictive. But I think that's one case where we're still looking for those best signatures because there's a lot of other factors. Someone could have uh, family problems. They could have had a becoming from a funeral. They could have other things that are not evident by their body language or keystroke speed at, at work that you, you know, there's a bit of a human element that we haven't yet automated. But I think there there is um you know, there is still a, a way to try and motivate people who are not doing as well and get them to do well. So I think that's the other thing is that the prediction might not be perfect yet at, at filtering. It's, it's helpful, but it's not perfect. But I think that the other thing in employment, it could help people go from poor to good to great or if they're great to stay great. And I think that's something we talk a little bit in the book that is just developing now is how do you really nurture your best performers as something we all want to do as, 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 as institutions and employers but it's, it's very hard. So AI is, is starting to track people. And again, in a benevolent world that would help people that are good be great and great stay great. But in a dystopian view, it would penalize people who had, you know, uh, they broke up with their girlfriend or they had a funeral, you know, or something. Uh, so we, we need to have the, the algorithms really accommodate the humanity.
Yeah. I think one of the discomforts people have with prediction in an area like job performance is people don't like that this cold computational prediction might have so much weight on their futures versus some process, some also predictive process, presumably predictive process, like a job interview where they want their personality to shine. And they think that this is going to be more reflective of their potential than just the cold numbers will be. But Chris, one one thing we haven't talked about yet that I know is a, a big part of your work is crime and genetic prediction. So one of the social benefits, as you two write about, of our increased knowledge of the human genome is our improved, though, I mean, obviously not infallible, ability to solve crimes. And you reference Gattaca, which is a movie I saw many years ago in a high school biology class, an example as an example of ways in which this improved knowledge of the genome can be discriminatory or downright dangerous. But what are some of the realistic problems here that you're most worried about? I think, you know, I'm on the one hand worried, but also hopeful. So I think like most things in the book is there's, there's pros and cons. And the, the, the worry is that this could be used to, you know, really discriminate against people who have a slightly elevated risk, say for hypertension, and they would not be able to get a job to, you know, maybe be a, or go to space, for example, for astronauts we talk about, uh, or that they wouldn't be able to do, you know, essentially maybe a seafaring job, that essentially anything that is a potential risk uh, could eliminate their ability to have a job or talk about Eddie Curry, you know, the basketball player who was just discriminated against based on his genetics. That was before the GINA was passed, the bill that prevented discrimination. But so there, there are worries where people who, uh, you know, might be at a, 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 you know, just a slightly higher risk and then it takes away the opportunity for them. And I think, though, this is actually something, though, that it, we want to understand the risk. But what's interesting about genetics is it has fundamentally changed in the past 10 years. It used to be you know, whatever your whatever your genetic risk was, that that was the genetic shuffle you got at birth. But now you can actually, as we described in the book, you can do CRISPR therapies to change your risk for, say, cholesterol levels or a sickle cell disease. You can do epigenetic therapies, meaning you change how genes are turned on and turned off. Uh, and that's also been deployed for sickle cell disease. So we can now you know move beyond what was just the shuffle you got as an embryo and really fundamentally change your risk. So I think it was fallacious before and potentially problematic, but now it's especially problematic because, you know, discriminating upon people's genetics is something that is not set in stone like it used to be 10 or 20 years ago or for the rest of human history. There are ways now in technologies th today that let us modify that risk or even eliminate that risk, which is extraordinary. Hmm. And something that I, I don't recall being mentioned in the book, but it's something sort of minority report like, but do people have any interest in trying to use somebody's DNA to predict crimes? Like perhaps see whether some structures in the brain lead people to be more likely to commit violent crimes, something like this. Is this a worry or a possibility? Something things are people are looking at? It's been discussed actually for a good while, 15, 20 years as, as fMRI got more routine to scan people's brains. I mean, in the book, we describe a lot of the genetic and molecular methods that you know, basically anything that you leave, you leave DNA anywhere and everywhere you go, and you can use that to track where you've been. Or we could even take a swab of the bottom of your shoe and tell you with about 93% accuracy where you came from, which city in the world. So we've published work like that. So there is all these little, little molecular clues on you and in you and always coming off of you. But I think for the brain, it's been it's taking a while for it to really be. I think it won't be used in court anytime soon. The molecular methods are much more sound, but the brain scanning methods to tell if you're if you're telling a lie or to predict the future are probably pretty far away. But but people are trying because the hope would be if someone's lying, you would you would be able to tell it and have it be unassailable, you know, potentially. But I, I think that that'll still be a ways off. But but the genetic and the molecular methods to track where you've been. Who's left, who left blood at the scene of a crime, how old they were, what they look like. That, that's actually fairly routine and even easy these days. Hmm. Igor, I'm just curious. I, I'm trying to get into your head a little bit. When you think about these sorts of things, do they raise 
to your mind questions of investment or future places to put capital like uh police forces might might want this sort of technology well of course uh yeah uh, there are all kinds of companies uh, working on uh, these kind of uh, technologies uh trying trying to read the uh, brain waves and uh and uh, uh trying to make uh, predictions of dna's uh of dna data so uh, of course they make uh interesting uh, investments uh, because uh, you know you, ne you never know one of them may uh, get it, get it right and uh, take off and do something uh, useful uh, but uh, so yeah, yes the answer is yes that we look at all kinds of companies that do all kinds of predictions and uh, all kinds of uh, uh, areas and uh, that's that's just where the world is headed Mm -hmm. And there's, there's also an investment group, World Club Ventures, does actually venture capital into new companies, but it's also for both the company and the venture group, but, you know, they become uh, interesting for both, I think. Yeah. Right. You you mentioned that they're interesting companies and they're, they're interesting, not just because the sort of technology is interesting, but if, and I, I'm not teaching you anything here, but maybe for our listeners who, who don't know so much about finance, um, a company like Apple, assuming that stock price is in some rough sense tethered to the size of the company or its, its market cap, something like this. There's only so much room that Apple can grow. Its stock price isn't going to go up a thousand times. That's very unlikely because then it'll have uh, a quadrillion dollar market cap. Uh, but a company that is valued at a million dollars or two million dollars that can go up a thousand ten thousand times so smaller companies with technologies like this that could be hugely promising would be consequently very promising investment vehicles for your venture arm i'm guessing on aggregate with the right uh, risk utilizations they they do out outperform uh so yes Mm -hmm. Good, good. I'm glad to be on the right track. And Chris, you you mentioned looking at DNA on someone's shoe and telling what city they're from. I'd love to hear more about that. Oh, sure, sure. So we we have a it's a project in the lab uh, that's been out swabbing subways since 2015. Uh, started just in New York City, but has expanded to a global consortium in over 100 cities that on on an annual and sometimes more frequent basis go out and swab public transit, city centers, hospitals in some cases, to build the genetic profile of the cities. It, it started first as a project out of pure curiosity because my daughter licked a subway pole and I just really wanted to know <laughs> it was there. But it's since expanded uh, into a much more uh, useful uh, project in the sense that we can track antibiotic resistance as it emerges. We can discover new species. We can actually track uh, things like COVID and where the virus is moving. And along the way, there's a forensic capacity because Every area of the world has a slightly different biodiversity profile at the macroscopic level, like kangaroos in Australia, but they're not in Canada. The same thing is true at a microbial level. So different areas of the world and cities have a unique signature that you can use to build algorithms to say, aha, I can see you have these specific microbes and viruses that are indicative of where you've come from. So we've used this project, it's called Metasub, or the metagenomics of subways and urban biomes to track sort of the, the dynamics of the urban environments in which we live and and there was an unexpected and uh, forensic capacity to the data as well. Hmm. Is it legal to just go out in public and collect random DNA? Or is this an area that is just very underregulated since you're the only person on earth who's interested in doing this? <laughs> good. So I have talked to several lawyers. I actually have one in particular who I worked with on the AMP versus Murad case that went to the Supreme Court where we won that case 9-0. But uh, he's offered to off, you know, represent me pro bono if I ever get arrested. And he, and he has looked and said it's definitely legal. That because if you think about it, if you take your hand and you grab a pole or you sit on a public seat, that, that's going to stick to you anyway. So what if you just walked around with like scotch tape on your hands or in your pants? You would get the DNA that way. So I, I, he, the, there's other ways you could get it if, if then someone didn't want you swabbing. But uh, it's interesting. It used to be look really strange to go out and swab subway systems in the middle of the day. 
But after the pandemic, everyone's like, oh, that's totally normal. That's completely fine. And we don't even get a second look anymore. It's, it's, it's changed. Winning a you know, case. Actually, uh, oh, sorry. Go uh, ahead, Igor. Sorry, sorry. I should mention that Chris one time found pigeon DNA on my phone. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We did, Igor's, actually, we did do an event. Uh, it was at one of the Milken conferences. Uh, this was with thanks to the support from Worldcom. We said, okay, let's do something fun at this, this meeting, like a, you know, a Milken conference where people have speakers and sessions. And we said, okay, let's people come through when they check in for the conference, we swabbed all their phones, extracted all the DNA sequenced it. And about 36 hours later, gave a report back to everyone to say, here's what was on your phone. And we looked at, see, we could see what people had been eating. We could see if they had cats or dogs. We could see if they'd been near pigeons. So we, we, uh, <laughs> that was, that was, I think in 2018, we did that like an event. It was a fairly fun event. Yes. All right, Igor, having Chris as a friend could be very dangerous if he's constantly swabbing you for DNA. <laughs> very uh, entertaining. He's, he swabbed uh, the wings of my airplane, too. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, uh, winning a case 9-0 in the Supreme Court today is uh, pretty remarkable given its division. So I'm I'm very impressed. One one last question about this, and then, then we'll wrap up. But given our incomplete information about the human genome today, what can you find out about just a given person, like about their own makeup, just from looking at something that you swab up, up off the off a subway pole? Oh, good question. So we, we uh, and some of this was in the forensics chapter is that if you take just a swab, you can look at the ancestry. So is the person, you know, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, we could look at census data. But you can also say, are, are they Jewish? There's a part we did Igor's genome and gave him a report on his DNA and he started out as Jewish. And as the databases improved a couple of years later, he got even more Jewish, which was which was kind of fun to see. Um, so he, he's, he's extra Jewy than more than he ever before. So he he's probably it could be like yeah, he's 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 pulling Judaism from the air at this point or something. So he's a uh, so because the, the databases are important, the databases, of course, get better and they change a little bit over time. But so you can look at ancestry, you can look at uh, effectively what is your risk for disease or potential you know, uh, ability to process drugs, what's called pharmacogenomics. So are, are you a fast metabolizer of caffeine or slow? We, we could see that in Igor. Are you a risk taker or not a lot on average? You know, So we, we could find that Igor was more of a risk taker, for example. We can look at your age, how old you are in your epigenetics. We can look at telomere length as well as DNA methylation for age. We could tell where you've been in the world based on your microbes. We can also essentially tell probably if you've been pregnant or you can, we can tell if we're recently pregnant. We can tell if you've recently had an infection, but get immune changes that if you've recently been infected or are you currently infected with different diseases. So as a, that, that's, there's a ton, you know, short, there's many other things you could do, but that's the top of my head of things we could quickly do uh, in a matter of, you know, hours basically. Okay, very cool. Well, I'll finish up with one uh, last question. I mean, I have the sense that, on the whole, despite its possible dangers, you two believe that entering the age of prediction is a net good thing for humanity. So first I'll ask Igor what you think maybe the, the most crucial uh, one or two things are that are the, the biggest positives for us going forward about this, even if they're general. Well, I'm an optimist by, by, by nature, but uh, uh, having said that, uh, I think uh, uh, there's a lots of room for uh, improvements to uh, health using predictions by better knowing uh, your risks and better managing them uh, from the beginning. So uh, uh, life quality, uh, life expectancy, uh, I think uh, we'll uh, get a positive uh, benefit from this and uh, we'll also get uh, lots of value from uh, from being uh, more precise, better weather, weather forecasts, uh, arriving on time, and uh, doing uh, more things uh, during the day. Of course, if uh, you schedule it too tightly and one of the predictions goes wrong, your your whole day is ruined. But, so, I really hope I live long enough to get a good bump from the increase in life expectancy. But Chris, I'm going to ask you the the flip side of that. What are the like? one or two biggest like dangers you see going forward with entering this age of prediction? Yeah. Now, now that we're here, I think there, there, there's dangers that, you know, people uh, that could have a dystopian world where people lose their rights uh, and be due to malfunctions of algorithms or that they have been prescribed exactly what they're supposed to do with their lives before their lives have begun, that we become more deterministic in biology, which is, 
which as I alluded to earlier, is, is no longer really the case. So there's a, there's a risk that people will become in love with their algorithms and p- presume it's, it's fate, not a prediction. And so I think that is a risk. But I actually think one of the biggest risks is that we get too afraid of deploying algorithms in AI. That my biggest worry is that we do it too slowly, that we get too afraid as you know, Elon Musk and others have come out and said we have to do a six month pause. Uh, meanwhile, lots of people are still working on it. So I, I think it, it's, it's like building many models and it's like any technology, predictions and algorithms and AI is a technology. So it will have good and bad. And I think you know, like, like fire, like atomic energy, like any tool, uh, you know, any, any tool can be used for a purpose or it can also be used as a weapon. But the tool, I think, in this case, could have such amazing opportunity to keep people healthier, longer. We could scan the sky for asteroids that could harm Earth. We have an ability to, you know, use the tools of finance to save longer for retirement and then live longer with medicine. So I think I'm overall optimistic, but there, there is the, the risk of determinism, the risk of the algorithms being wrong, uh, and also just of, of, you know, the system even depending too much on an algorithm that is imperfect. Or sometimes we know some of the algorithms for facial recognition are, are racist based on their training data. So that's just a question of training data. But they've been trained mostly on, you know, uh, white people's faces. So they'll be racist. So, you know, the, the, but we, we can start to see these risks and then fix them. So I think we have to make sure that we're always constantly gardening the code and make sure it's improving like we do with most things. Hmm. Well, Chris, Igor, it was great to meet both of you. This topic is so fascinating and practical in countless dimensions. Thanks a lot for writing this book and for doing this work and for having this conversation with me. Pleasure. Thank you for having us. Hold on. If you haven't subscribed, liked, commented, or reviewed, that would be so helpful. And if you haven't yet, you could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Robinson Earhart.